The girl has been sitting in the waiting room for at least 20 minutes now, curled up on a hard plastic chair and staring at an inspirational poster on the wall. Her eyes are bleary and unfocused, with heavy dark circles that indicate she hasn't been sleeping well. She tries to focus her attention on the poster and read the words, but she's having trouble concentrating. She keeps nodding off, only to jerk back to wakefulness when her head starts to sag. This is what life is like for her after weeks of insomnia. She was just about at the end of her rope, certain that this was going to be her life from now on, until she happened to see an ad in the newspaper for a study at a local sleep clinic. She doesn't think much of that sort of thing, but she's desperate for anything that might help her to get a good night's sleep. Eventually, the door opens and a technician calls her into his office. The girl stumbles to her feet and drags herself inside. Thanks for volunteering to be part of our study, says the technician. He's got a friendly smile and a soothing manner that instantly puts her at ease. It's obvious from his bedside manner that he's worked with lots of sleep-deprived patients before. He pulls out a clipboard and starts to make notes on a sheet of paper. We've gone over your application and we think that you would be a really good fit for this project. Thank goodness, thinks the girl. She had just about given up hope after that long wait. She half expected that they would simply tell her that she didn't qualify and send her home to try and figure out how to get over her insomnia by herself. So you've been having trouble sleeping, says the technician. Tell me about that. The girl hunches her shoulders. There's not much to tell. I've had sleep problems for years. I have really bad sleep apnea, so I've always been a rough sleeper. I toss and turn, and I wake up at least several times a night, but it's really gotten bad lately. I can barely even drift off to sleep these last few weeks. The technician nods. That's exactly the kind of problem that we want to look into here, he says. For this study, we're going to monitor you as you sleep and see if we can diagnose this problem. She nods. The technician keeps talking, but she's not listening. She doesn't really care about the details. The important thing is that she's going to finally get a decent night's sleep. The technician leads her to a laboratory, a large room with several simple cots arranged along the walls. Next to each cot, she sees a bank of odd electronic machines. She doesn't immediately know what they're for, but she can guess. She's participated in sleep studies before, in hopes that they might be able to help cure her issues, and they usually connect machines like these to your forehead as you sleep so that they can read your pulse and brain activity. Sorry, it's not the most comfortable arrangement, says the technician, but all you have to do is sleep. There's a bathroom down the hallway if you need to get ready for bed. When you're ready, we'll prepare you for the next step. The girl doesn't care if the cots aren't all that comfortable in the technician's opinion. This might as well be the plushest feather bed to her. After changing into her night clothes and brushing her teeth, the girl returns to the lab. She finds the technician waiting for her, holding what appears to be a perfectly ordinary CPAP machine. The girl, of course, recognizes this device. She's used these things on multiple occasions in her desperation to find a solution to her sleep apnea. They're supposed to help open up the breathing passageways to increase airflow and thus reduce the incidence of sleep apnea, but the girl has never had much luck with them. She frowns. If this study is just testing a new sort of CPAP machine, she doesn't have a lot of faith that it's going to help her much. The technician notices her dismay. I know that you've probably used these before, he says. This is just the first step. We want to see how your sleep cycles react to ordinary treatments before we try anything more radical. Okay, sure. The girl doesn't have the strength to argue. She's bone tired, and she's ready to collapse into bed. Without another word, she takes the CPAP mask from the technician and straps it to her face. She climbs into bed, and the technician attaches the hose to the machine next to the bed. He switches it on, and the machine begins to emit a familiar, comforting hum. The technician attaches several electrodes to the girl's cheeks and forehead. He starts to explain that these will allow him to monitor her sleep cycles and check for any anomalous reactions. She's barely listening at this point. I'll just be monitoring you from the next room, says the technician, pointing to a video camera in the corner of the ceiling. So don't worry about anything. If there are any problems, I'll be watching. The girl barely has the strength to nod her head in response. She's so incredibly tired. Already she's drifting into oblivion. The room is swimming before her eyes, her mind distracted by hypnagogic illusions. The technician's voice sounds like it's a million miles away. She's practically already dreaming. Her eyes close before he even leaves the room. The technician takes his station at his desk, sitting before a bank of video monitors. The grainy gray feed from the security camera shows that the girl is fast asleep in her bunk, her chest rising and falling rhythmically with her breathing. Nothing unusual going on so far. The technician takes a sip from a mug of coffee and prepares for another boring night of watching someone else sleep. 
Of course, he hopes that the information gleaned from his observations might be of use in helping this girl to solve her sleep problems. And he hopes in turn that might help other people with similar sleep apnea issues as well. But for now, he's just staring at the screen with half-hearted interest. At first, everything is quiet. The CPAP machine seems to be doing the trick, allowing the girl to breathe quietly and sleep peacefully. The technician watches without interest as the girl progresses through the different levels of sleep, the monitors in front of him reflecting the changes in her biorhythms. It isn't until she reaches her second round of REM sleep, the stage in which a sleeper dreams, that something strange happens. Under her eyelids, the girl's pupils quickly flick back and forth, almost as if she's watching a film. This is totally normal behavior, of course, during REM sleep. The technician barely even looks up as the monitors register her transition into this new sleep stage. He's been working at the sleep clinic for long enough that he knows to expect this. He might not have even looked up if his coffee cup hadn't happened to finally run out. When he hefts his empty mug, mumbling to himself in annoyance that now he's going to have to walk all the way across the facility to refill it at the coffee machine in the break room, that's when he finally catches sight of it. Huh? It happens so suddenly that at first the technician doesn't believe his eyes. He thinks it must be a glitch in the hardware or possibly that his own eyes are playing tricks on him. Huh? He has been drinking a lot of coffee to stay awake after all, but no, it's really there. He can see that there is a second person in the room now, a large, dark silhouette standing over the girl as she sleeps. He blinks in surprise. How did someone get into the building, much less the laboratory, without him knowing? The figure is silent and motionless. It hardly seems threatening, but at the same time, it's hard not to read someone as threatening when they break into your room and stare at you as you sleep. As he watches, the figure starts to change subtly before his eyes. Soon, it's not just a solid blob of shadow. It's coalesced into a human figure, that of a large male humanoid. Its torso bulging with muscles, its arms laced with sinews, but instead of a face, this figure has the gleaming white skull of a horse. It remains standing over the girl. The girl snorts and turns in her sleep, grunting and mumbling. She's acting as if she's caught in an especially troubling nightmare and is struggling to wake up. The creature standing over her does not react to her movements. Instead staring down at her with an eerie, unflappable calm. The grainy camera footage makes it hard to make out the details, but the technician is almost certain he can see the tiniest flicker, like the reflection of light in a dilated pupil, in the empty sockets of the mysterious stranger's skull. The skull doesn't react. How could it react, after all? It's just a skull. But its silence, with that rictus grin and empty sockets, only makes it more frightening than if it had reacted. The technician gulps and rises to his feet, his knees shaking. He can't let this go on. He doesn't know what kind of practical joke is going on, but he did promise the girl that he would be responsible for her safety if anything weird happened. More to the point, the presence of this masked stranger might jeopardize the results of the study. He hurries from the office, making a beeline for the laboratory. He doesn't exactly know what he's going to say or do when he confronts this stranger. He just knows that he has to do it. But then, he starts to feel sleepy himself. The closer he gets to the laboratory, the more his own body starts to defy him. His limbs feel rubbery, his eyes feel heavy, and his thoughts start to swim. Despite all the coffee in his system, he also feels himself succumbing to sleep. He's only 50 yards from the door when he finally collapses into a heap on the floor. His eyes remain wide open, staring sightlessly ahead of him, and his mouth gapes like a fish out of water. Whatever he's experiencing, whether it's something that only he can see or something in his mind, his expression reveals only abject terror. Meanwhile, at the exact moment that the technician collapses, the figure standing over the girl in the lab blinks momentarily out of existence, as if somehow reacting to the commotion outside. And when it returns, it isn't alone. A second dark figure has also appeared in the room. It too starts life as an indistinct, only vaguely humanoid shadow, but quickly starts to gain form. This one is different from the first. It's a female body, but the figure's head has a blank face devoid of eyes, mouth, or nose. This second figure ignores the sleeping girl or her strange, stoic, horse-headed observer. Instead, it starts to move, ambling toward the western wall of the room, as if it knows that the comatose technician is directly on the other side. When it reaches the wall, it does not pause. It simply phases through the solid structure, disappearing through the brick and mortar, and reappearing in the hallway beyond. The faceless woman approaches the prone body of the technician. It squats down next to him and puts its hand under his chin, turning his head so that it can stare into his eyes, or stare as effectively as possible when it doesn't have any eyes of its own. 
After a few moments of silent contemplation, the faceless creature places its hand against the technician's forehead. Slowly, its hand starts to move through his head, reaching deep into his skull as if its hand was as insubstantial as a ghost. Just as this mysterious nightmare creature was able to phase through the wall, it appears to be able to phase through flesh as well. After several moments, the faceless woman withdraws its hand and drops the technician's head. He slumps to the ground in response. The faceless woman stands up and then… it vanishes instantly. At the exact same time, the girl in the other room snorts and stirs. She blinks her eyes open. For a moment, she doesn't remember where she is. Her eyes scan the unfamiliar room for several seconds before she recalls that she was participating in a sleep study. That's right, she was trying to find out if she could find any help for her sleep apnea. Ironically, she actually slept better than normal. As she removes the CPAP mask, she wonders if maybe she ought to see about buying one of these for herself. This particular model seems to work better than the one she's tried in the past. She stretches and sits up. Just then, the technician bursts into the room. He's panicked and out of breath, and he whips his head back and forth in search of the mysterious horse-headed stranger. But there's no sign of the creature now. Just like the faceless woman, it seems to have vanished without a trace. The girl stares at him in confusion. Why is he so upset? She has no clue about what happened while she was asleep. Did you see it? Says the technician breathlessly. The creature! The shadow creature! The girl raises a skeptical eyebrow. What are you talking about? She says. I just woke up. The technician starts to sputter out an explanation, but the girl just rolls her eyes. She came here to get help with her sleep, but it sounds like the technician is the one who's got a real problem. His breathless descriptions of a horse-headed monster and a faceless woman clearly sound like bad dreams to her. You would think that a guy running a sleep study wouldn't be so easily confused like that. She's pretty sure that he probably just fell asleep at his station, and now he's embarrassed to admit that he just had a bad dream. Little do either of them know that although they won't see the strange entities again, those creatures are always going to be very, very close to them going forward. What a nightmare. But what seems like just a bad dream is, in fact, an anomaly well known to the SCP Foundation. It's formally been designated as SCP-3060, but agents more often refer to it as the Dream Machine. Instances of SCP-3060 are small medical devices that superficially resemble continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP machines. The individual materials that compose SCP-3060 instances are non-anomalous and operate in the same way as a typical CPAP machine of its size and make. The Foundation currently has five instances of SCP-3060 in its custody. SCP-3060's anomalous effects become apparent when worn by a sleeping human. When an individual wearing an instance of SCP-3060 enters their second REM cycle, a humanoid incorporeal entity, hereafter referred to as SCP-3060-A, will appear within a 5-meter radius of the individual and stand over them until they wake up. At this point, SCP-3060-A will disappear, and the individual wearing SCP-3060 will become infected. From that point on, regardless as to whether the individual wears SCP-3060, the same SCP-3060-A entity will appear when they enter their second REM cycle each night and remain watching over them until awakening. While instances of SCP-3060-A appear as featureless silhouettes upon their first manifestation, they quickly take on a unique shape based on each infected individual. SCP-3060-A entities have no standard appearance, and it is not clear what factors determine the final form of any individual SCP-3060-A. Since the manifestations are connected with REM sleep, agency researchers speculate that an SCP-3060-A's appearance may be influenced by an infected sleeper's dreams. So far, observed SCP-3060-A's have included a human infant composed entirely of fused teeth, an eyeless elderly woman dressed in dark clothes, a partially disintegrated humanoid composed of ash and dressed in red lingerie, a naked humanoid covered in tire tracks and showing signs of severe crush injuries, a humanoid whose torso consisted of a large mouth, and a clown. Some researchers have noted that the initial shadowy appearances of SCP-3060-A recall descriptions of entities reported during bouts of sleep paralysis, but so far, no conclusive link has been found. While an SCP-3060-A instance is present, any person standing within a 50-meter radius of the infected sleeper will enter a catatonic state. At this point, an additional instance of SCP-3060-A will appear. 
the additional SCP-3060-A entity will then approach the catatonic subject, phasing through solid matter if the subject is in a separate room. Upon arriving at the subject, the new SCP-3060-A instance will phase its hand through the subject's skull and then vanish, causing the subject to fall asleep immediately. All subjects touched by the SCP-3060-A entity in this manner will become new instances of SCP-3060 infected upon awakening. Awakening an infected sleeper will cause the attending SCP-3060-A to immediately vanish and catatonic subjects to regain movement. All attempts to communicate with SCP-3060-A instances have thus far been unsuccessful. People infected by SCP-3060 will inevitably suffer long-term health effects, most often associated with severe sleep deprivation. After three days, infected individuals begin to display fatigue, mood changes, impaired performance, and memory problems, all of which are so severe that even obtaining a full night's sleep does little to dent their impact. Infected individuals often report frequent nightmares, though no central themes or correlations have been observed in the content of these dreams, nor do they seem to correspond with the appearance of the infected persons attending SCP-3060-A. Within a month, infected individuals will start having visual and auditory hallucinations, as well as delusions that their mind is being controlled by some outside force. Soon after, infected individuals descend into full psychosis as they become unable to distinguish the content of their dreams from reality. In extreme cases, after at least two months of infection, hair loss, canides subita, partial or complete blindness, somatic complaints, cataplexy, and alien limb syndrome have been observed. Attempts by medical staff to alleviate these conditions in the long term have thus far been met with failure, although sleep deprivation has ironically proven effective in temporarily delaying the onset of more severe symptoms. If no human subjects entered the area of an SCP-3060 infected individual's effect during REM sleep for seven consecutive days, or the infected individual dies, an instance of SCP-3060-A will appear. The SCP-3060-A entity will then proceed to search for the nearest sleeping human. Upon locating a sleeper, SCP-3060-A will stand over them until they enter their next REM sleep cycle, at which point, the SCP-3060-A entity will reach into their skull and vanish. At this point, the sleeping individual will become infected. If the sleeping individual wakes up before the process is complete, or if SCP-3060-A cannot locate a suitable subject within three hours, it will vanish without spreading the SCP-3060 infection. In one experiment, an infected individual was placed in a standard humanoid containment cell. Four D-class personnel were placed in adjoining cells. When the infected individual fell asleep and entered their second REM cycle, an SCP-3060-A entity appeared with predictable results. The first SCP-3060-A to appear resembled a headless humanoid with its arms and legs replaced by spinal columns. It stood above the infected sleeper, watching without movement, even as four additional instances of SCP-3060-A manifested inside the cell. All five SCP-3060-A instances stood in silent observation of the infected sleeper for approximately five minutes. By this point, all four D-class personnel in adjoining cells had gone into catatonic states, seeing as they were within the 50-square-meter blast zone established by the initial SCP-3060-A. Each D-class personnel who was awake at the time of manifestation was observed to have frozen with expressions of extreme distress on their face. The four additional SCP-3060-A instances then began to disperse, each one moving toward a different D-class personnel's cell, phasing through solid matter as necessary to reach the intended target. Each additional SCP-3060-A instance completed its manifestation by reaching into the skull of its target and then subsequently assuming a definite, final form before vanishing. The four additional SCP-3060-As, respectively, took on the appearance of a male human with mathematical symbols in place of facial features, a humanoid composed of tightly wound thread, a featureless white humanoid dressed in a foundation lab coat, and a featureless black humanoid dressed in a hodgepodge of regalia from different authoritarian regimes. The initial SCP-3060-A continued to stand in silent observation of the original infected sleeper after the other instances vanished, remaining so for the rest of the night until she woke up. Since SCP-3060 has not been found to differ in any way from a normal CPAP machine, SCP agents currently know very little about how SCP-3060 can cause these manifestations, who is manufacturing SCP-3060, or for what purpose. 
At this time, the only advice that SCP researchers can offer is this. If you're having trouble sleeping and want to make use of a CPAP machine, make sure you're buying a name brand. Otherwise, you might just be opening yourself up to a world of nightmares, insomnia, and silent but all too present nocturnal visitors. If you want to support this important mission while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2119, Transmitting Parasite, for another tale of something that's always alert as you sleep. And to make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.